Football on off the ball with William Hill. Who you got? 18 plus see gamblingcare.ie. This is News Talk. Lana Canan here with you on Off the Ball Sunday. Nolik Naman special, and I have former Irish international Maeve de Berka alongside me here in studio. Thanks for coming in, Maeve. No problem. How are you doing? We have plenty to talk about there. I just shocked her there um, during the ad break. Sam Kerr, ACL injury. Yeah, huge news. Um, you know, she's so influential for Chelsea and uh, Australia, obviously, as well. And um, it's just another high profile player now with another ACL. Unfortunately, it just keeps so rampant in the game. We're getting too used to it. But before we dive into all things football, Glenn have nine points to Kilmacore Croaks, four at halftime in, in, in Nori in the fog. So we'll keep you up to date on that one. But uh, I was just thinking there, the last time I saw you was the homecoming of the Irish Women's National Team after the World Cup and how times have changed since then? Yeah, only a few months really, but so much has happened. Um, Obviously such a successful um, Nations League campaign between um, then and now, which was um, really good for the girls. I think... um, you know, they did all that they could in, in that, getting getting the full maximum points and promotion as well and obviously change of management too and yeah, so much in between. So the six wins from six for Eileen Gleeson and lots and lots of goals and everything too as well in the Nations League. We're now into Nations League A and it was just announced that before Christmas there that Eileen Gleeson has taken over on a permanent basis. What did you think of that move? It kind of, everyone was kind of thinking it would happen and then we were being told it wasn't and then... Shock, here we are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in the end, I think it was kind of a surprise almost yeah. for, for people in general because, um, you know, we would have thought that maybe she would have been appointed initially. Um, maybe they were sort of doing it on a bit of a trial basis. Um, also, I think it's um, kind of really, um, you know, it's they've only given her a short term almost con- in that it's only for one campaign, which is um, a bit different to the usual um, where generally it would be given over like uh, two two campaigns, you know, Euros and a World Cup where her contract only runs to the end of the Euros. Um, so I don't know, I suppose it's maybe them playing it safe as well in, in a way in that they just want to um, do it on a kind of short term basis, see how she gets on and that type of thing. And also her role, I think the the head of women's football role seems to be only um, advertised on a contract basis as well. So that's not a permanent role for whoever takes that on now so um, maybe there's something in line there where she may end up going back to that role I don't know um, but definitely it's a positive appointment I think and I think she's going to be really good in the role. Yeah because even when people were asking me about it like would I have liked to see her in the role like obviously things went very well and that's kind of one thing but she was so qualified for the head of women's and girls football that you're kind of like who was going to go into that role now? that would be better than I Yeah, exactly. And I think it's, um, you know, for the development of the game, I think the, the head of women's football um, is a more important role than that national team manager because um, obviously the, the national team manager needs to look on a short-term basis and get results um, as quickly as possible for the, the success of the national team. Whereas in the other role, there's a lot more kind of structures to be put in place and strategies and all that type of thing, which I think would benefit the, the game in the medium to long term in Ireland, which is obviously really important um, in order to get success over the long term. So, so, yeah, like you said, it's going to be really interesting to see who ends up in that role. As you say as well, we're at such a pivotal point of women's football in Ireland. You know, you're going on the back of the, or the hype of the, the World Cup. I suppose it wasn't successful in terms of results, but it was in terms of inspiring the next generation. So we're at such a key moment where things... We really need to push on from here. And as you say, that's such an important role in that. That's the thing, yeah. We really need to kind of piggyback on the increased um, promotion and e- increased kind of um, hype, like you said, over the team and interest in the team now is the time to really kind of push that on. But it needs to be done from the grassroots level. Like you said, it's kind of inspiring the younger girls. So obviously we're going to have increased participation, but it's what do we do with that increased participation now? Like, are, is there outlets for those girls to play and to push on to be elite as well? Do we have the right structure? in place after that like um, I mean we've the forgotten age group of our of our college ages where we've no national team after under 19 and if you don't make it um, you know through at, at under 19 level um, then you're sort of forgotten about if you can't um, you know not everyone is going to be in Abby Larkin where she can you know go and get a professional contract at such a young age which is great for her but um, you know we're not I don't think we're doing enough in terms of having scholarships or any of that type of thing for, for the girls who aren't making it straight from under 19 to the senior team yeah, that's such an interesting point. We'll come back to it in just a second. But it's former Irish international Maeve de Berke who's here in studio with me. We were talking about before we throw to threw to Ashing there um, about the underage teams in in the Ireland setup. Is that something you'd like to see brought in on the women's side of the game? Because as I say, we are missing an under twenty one 
international team? Definitely, yeah. I think um, it's been something we've been crying out for for years. Um, you know, England have um, the under-23 team there uh, successful. You know, you can see how girls like that who aren't making it straight to the seniors are getting so, so much vital uh, international experience with under-23. So um, I think it's really important because you can't really buy that experience. And even, you know, if they are playing at a high club level, then maybe it's still not transferring into having the international experience. It's fascinating as well because, as you mentioned, Abby Larkin got her chance over the summer and she was good enough and ready to go and took the opportunity as well with both hands. But it's probably one of those ones where we were maybe lacking a bit up front and that's how she got in for the opportunity, where there's other players that are at a similar level maybe in a different position on the pitch, they just can't break in. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, I mean, there's the likes of Jess Sue as well waiting in the wings too. And, you know, she's just up against it. We're, we're stacked really um, in terms of our defensive, um, you know, um, qualities that we have. But um, yeah, I think there's a lot of girls there that, you know, they could could benefit from getting more more game time and then really developing. So then when they do, you know, hit the age of 22, 23, they're really raring to go and become a starter and really become so influential then hopefully at that stage. But yeah, it's um, something that I think, you know, should be looked at maybe and um, if we could get an under 23 team I think it would be really important Because we saw that under Eileen Gleeson in her first reign there you know she was bringing in these younger players Erin McLaughlin came in, Izzy Atkinson embedded themselves into the squad really under her reign even though Atkinson was in obviously for the World Cup but then you had the two peas in a pod Freya Healy and Ellen Dolan as you say they're so young and have so much potential and talent as well as Abby Larkin Elle Malloy, Jess Sue Tyler Tullin, Jesse Stapleton, you could go on. There's so much youth and potential here. Yeah, it's great to see. Um, you know, there's always been kind of one or two around the squad, but now it's really the numbers, like you mentioned there, they're really um, increasing and they're really pushing the players who are in there at the moment to, you know, trying to get their spots off them. And um, yeah, I think it's important just that that kind of conveyor belt keeps coming through as well. And um, I think the, the women's Premier Division here as well is definitely helping that. Um, you can see that the girls are, you know, they've been playing, especially with the academies, you under age, under 17, under 19 leagues as well. Um, they're getting plenty of kind of um, competitive games year round, which is so important. And um, you can see it then, it's kind of coming, it's it's leading to them then getting these um, moves so early on in their careers, which mightn't have happened, you know, if the league here wasn't in place. That probably comes back as well to the head of women's and girls football kind of role. But if you're looking at the setup at the minute, the pathway seems to be you know, perform in the Women's Premier Division, get a move overseas and then see if you can break into either a team in Scotland or the WSL. Is that something, like, I mean, that's probably just a reality at the minute, but is it something you'd like to see change in the future? Yeah, probably. I think it would be kind of good if we could keep the girls at home maybe a little bit longer, even for another couple of years. Mm. And I don't think it would take that much. I don't think the standard between the Irish League and the Scottish League, I don't think there's much yeah. there. Um, it's, you know, and in terms of the, the financial rewards, I don't think there's much of a difference either. So if we could kind of compensate the girls a little bit in order to make it um, kind of easier for them to stay here at home and not necessarily have to have a job then while they're um, playing in the league here I think that's all that's needed really and then we can really kind of um, drive the standards on in the league here if we can keep the players, retain them for at least another few years keep them in the league, keep the standards up and then it brings up the standards of all the players around them as well So, Because it takes a bit of time to settle as well even Katie McCabe when she first started with Arsenal I think it's 2015, you know it took her time to settle in and get used to it as well Yeah that's the thing and I think initially she wasn't getting much game time so she did have to go on loan to, to Glasgow as well so yeah it's not all like plain sailing I suppose and you know even Katie is obviously at the top of her game now like um, she, I suppose she's just a proven kind of um, proves that it isn't all um, straightforward and you know a move overseas isn't maybe necessarily the best thing for all players either and obviously um, from a female perspective it's not go, you know their deals aren't lucrative in that they may need also to have an education behind them I think that's important too like the likes of Amber Barrett, Clara Reard, and um, those those types of um, girls, I suppose they've they've um, had a degree behind them as well. Even Louise Quinn, a lot of the girls in Ufahi too have all, you know they've a good education behind them, so that they have something to fall back on, you know, when their careers end as well. Is that something you're conscious of when you're even playing? Because obviously, I know in the women's Premier Division there are clubs who are tied in with colleges even, and then that keeps them 
I suppose geographically it spreads things out as well. So is yeah. that something people are conscious of? Do you think? I think so, yeah. And I think it's important to kind of um, strengthen those links and those ties as well because um, like that, like I said, the, the colleges are nicely spread around geographically and play, um, clubs can easily link in with them. I know um, Galway United, you know, they're linked in with the University of Galway and um, they have a good kind of connection there where a lot of the players are, are playing um, at a high level both in the colleges team and then playing with the Premier Division as well. And I think if they can provide, you know, like I was mentioned there earlier, scholarships as well within the colleges um, and also, you know, it would be great to see if, if some form of kind of, um, you know, bursaries or scholarships would, could be given to the girls at, at a national um, national team level. But maybe just on the fringes, I know Cabaries do um, give, uh, you know, financial rewards to the players on the national team now. But I think maybe that might be better served given to players who are on the fringes mm. who aren't, you know, receiving the, the um, same kind of reimbursement that they are, um, which I think would be really vital because then it would end up meaning that the girls could essentially be playing full time without having to, um, yeah. you know, um, work on the side. So it would be huge, I think. Yeah, because that's something people forget when you're watching women's football. Like often they do balance jobs alongside all this as well. Like, yeah, and being like a student and yeah. a football player and a, a part-time worker is just, it's a lot to, to combine. And, um, you know, if that the working side could be taken out of it, it would just give them so much more time to be able to develop then as, as footballers. And I think that that would be really important. Definitely. Uh, up on 12 minutes gone between Arsenal and Liverpool now, nil nil still in the FA Cup. But we were chatting Eileen Gleeson and all things Irish women's national team there a second ago. How do you think she'll fare now? We're into League A. Things are going to be different, Mav. That's the thing. Yeah, it was all uh, nice and rosy, you know, um, in the, the autumn and the winter last year. And it was great to see and nice to be able to kind of watch an Irish team, either men's or women's, been able to play some nice attacking football, score some great goals. And um, But like you said, I think maybe those days are a little bit over at the moment and um, it'll be really interesting to see now who we get in the draw. Um, there's some top teams that we could be playing against, so I think we'll be really up against it. But um, like you said, it's going to be a big challenge and I think it'll be really it'll kind of prove now see how Eileen kind of adapts and what sort of role or the team what kind of tactics and formation the team are going to play whether we'll we'll go back and revert back to the five at the back which you know in, in fairness has been successful and gotten us results too so um, it'll just just be interesting or will we see a bit more of the free-flowing attacking football and of course where will Katie and Denise play is another um, always a good talking point as well and you know will they be pushed higher off the pitch I think Denise is slotting in well um, you know into her preferred position but then it's just a matter of where will Katie play. It is that because even in the latter matches in Nations League B there you had Katie and Denise playing alongside each other and then Cruz up top who's in great form as well so it is a matter of will that all continue or will we see Katie slide back the pitch as well? That's the thing and I think what is kind of I suppose what will determine that is is how well Izzy Atkinson plays really because she's a perfectly good fit there for that left wing back position you know she has all the attributes I think needed um, to play in that position and it's just yeah whether she's on form or not and I think if she's playing well that'll mean that Katie will be up the pitch essentially and if she's not playing particularly well then we may see Katie revert back um, to left wing back. The draw will be upcoming in the next few months but who would you like? I suppose it'd be more a matter of who would I like to avoid really, um, when all those um, teams come out. But I, mean, I think I think give us England. Yeah, I'd actually that's love a, in England. fairness. It'd be uh, one we're crying out for for years to play, and you know we've never played a friendly in in my memory anyway against them. And I think it'd be really it'd be such a showdown. Like imagine if uh, we're playing against England in the Aviva, that would be really like kind of a mouth watering tie. I think, and um, you know to play them over in England as well would be really like kind of I think it'd be very monumental, and it would really. Give give us a good indication of where we're at as well like obviously England are um, one of the top teams in the world and um, yeah it'd be great great to see that happen who knows yeah because as I say at the Aviva match this year I think it was just over 35,000 was that it like yeah. that match if we had the likes of an England or a Spain any of the top teams come that would be the parameter for how much interest there is in women's football in Ireland. Yes, that's it, exactly. Like, our, you know, players coming then to see also, to see the other national teams, which obviously happens on the men's side when Ronaldo comes to town. Yeah. It's always sell out in the Aviva. So if you did see the, the um, Spanish World Cup um, winning team come to town as well, that would be a really kind of really good one, I think. And like you said, it would gauge interest. It's whether these now are going to be once-off events. You know, obviously the first game, the Aviva was always going to attract attention, especially when it's on a Saturday afternoon. But... Um, 
you know, it's now, now where, where do we go from here? Can we kind of keep getting those crowds up, um, you know, on a kind of regular basis? Talking here on Nullagnamon weekend, uh, I was looking at the gender pay gap between the Irish women's manager and the Irish men's manager. It was reported that pay was on an estimated 150,000 and Stephen Kenny was reported to be on a lot more than that, let's say. Is it time that gap was narrowed, do you think, especially considering the women's team got to the World Cup and did all they did? Yeah, I think there could definitely kind of be um, performance related, I think, bonuses and that type of thing as well to, to bring up that gap, um, particularly if they are performing out of, you know, or performing better than expected and, and that type of thing. Well, I think it's probably a, a cultural issue all, you know, across the board and not, mm. it's probably not just isolated to, to women's football or to football in general. Um, you know, you probably do see that across a lot of the sports as well and um, and not just in Ireland, I think across um, you know, um, in England as well it's, um, you know, there, there's definitely the pay gap there as well so it's yeah it's a I suppose it's a big talking point but it's one that I think that the gap can definitely be narrowed I think Emma Hayes was the first to equal it obviously uh, landing that job in the US it's up on a million a year there both the men's and the women's manager are reported to be on but on to the WSL then lots of rumours floating about about who's going where the usual during the transfer season maybe <laughs> in particular the big one that seems to keep cropping up Mary Earps where do you think she'll end up who knows? Like it's hard to know. Um, she's uh, really in demand anyway. Obviously, the top for game now and the top goalkeeper in the world. Um, I think she's also just signed with a new agent as well. So, um, it, it's uh, your guess is as good as mine. I think <laughs> on that one. Um, I don't. I can't see her staying at United. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I think a move will definitely be in line for her. But I suppose it's it's what's for, what suits her too. Does she want to stay in the WSL? Um, or or will she go abroad? Um, but it's it's definitely going to be really an interesting one to follow. Because talking about culture impact winning the BBC Sports Personality of the Year and then everything that happened with Nike and her jerseys over the World Cup like there really is a lot to look into there with her like she's just she's massive at the minute and that's what you need in the women's game Definitely, and it's, it's really unusual for a goalkeeper. Um, you know, either men's or women's, so just not the most popular position in general. N not too many um, children grow up, you know, wanting to be goalkeepers. They kind of end up and just thrown in there because they they might have older brothers and they're just put in in the sticks um, in the back garden in between the, um, in the in the goals. But um, yeah, she's really brought a lot of kind of limelight to the position almost, and um, a lot of young girls now, like I said, even um, with her jersey's been sold out on Nike, and you know, she's really kind of a really popular figure. And it's great to see that kind of in the game and um, you'd love to see it, um, you know, then the, the impact knock-on effect then is just more more girls growing up wanted to be goalkeepers as well. For sure. And West Ham are busy too. They're looking to keep themselves out of the rele relegation zo zone. They're after signing Katrina Gorey, who's their third January signing. They've also signed Chrissy Mewis and Shalina Zadursky will they avoid the drop is the big question yeah it's hard to know um, I think they're in 11th place at the moment maybe so um, you yeah know, it's just it's Megan Connolly and Chloe Masaki's Bristol are the only ones below them yeah so they, they're going to be up against it and uh, fortunately I suppose that will mean that, that some of the Irish girls may be relegated you know this this coming season but um, you know there's a lot, a lot of Irish um, interest in, in West Ham as well and I think they're yeah obviously they're they're shown intent now by by um, making those three um, big big signings over the transfer window and it just really depends what the teams around them do as well whether they also are investing too but I think you know a lot that, that quality will definitely help them push up the table I would imagine anyway It's tied up the top end as well Emma Hayes is Chelsea on 25 City and Arsenal both on 22 it'd be a nice farewell for her if she could close out with, with the title again Yeah I think and I'd say that's that's what her aim is obviously as well and um, you know I'm, I'm sure the girls uh, the players at Chelsea will be playing for her even more so now when they, they know they want to give her um, a good send off and um, yeah they're, they're looking in good posi uh, position at the moment but like you said it's, it's really tight at the top and there's still I think um, there's only 10 games played so you know lot, lots of, d of big um, high profile games and six pointers really when it's so, so tight at the top and it's it's good to see it because a lot of leagues, I suppose, um, particularly in Spain and that mightn't be as kind of competitive from, from top to bottom. But definitely there's five teams there that are really kind of still in contention, I think, for the title. Do you manage to get over to any of the games yourself? No, not not at the moment. I was well, I was, was travelling and I was kind of busy doing a few bits there with the underdogs and, and that over the, the autumn. But hopefully now in the in the new year or this year I'll I might get over to a game or two. You took the words right out of my mouth. The underdogs was the next thing I was about to ask <laughs> yeah. about. Um that looked brilliant and obviously again shedding light on the women's game and all the talent that 
must have slipped through the cracks really over the years. Yeah, it was amazing to see um, the quality that was there. You know, in, in the trials initially, um, there were so many applicants. Like um, we had to go through it to, to narrow it down before we even invited the people to try it. So it just showed how much interest. You know, I thought initially, will there even be enough interest to make it happen? You know, and then um, to make it a good kind of watch as well. But it, um, there was no shortage of talent. Like it was really, really hard to narrow it down. Um, like the, it was kind of a mixed bag at the start because there was we had such a high number of applicants that it was. Um, but once we got down you know, to the, the final trials. It was really, really hard, but it was um it was great to see all the girls kind of come through and then develop as the time as it went on. And it also really stood out, you know, I know um Jesse and Alex Mendez's mum was one of the main people on it. Yeah. Barbara. Barbara it? does yeah. it, yeah. And um that that's so funny because obviously she played a big role in inspiring them into football and like they're on the women's Premier Division stage now. So it must be nice to pay it back as well to her. Yeah, it was kind of a, a full circle moment I suppose for them, especially when we played um Cork City down down in Cork because I know initially when we announced that it was going to be going night we, we played like there was a slight maybe disappointment because she, she thought that now her chance was gone to play um, against her daughters but then obviously they arranged the, the challenge match against Cork and that was really great because it, um, it kind of, we learned a lot as well from that game because they're, they're at such a high standard compared to the other um, you know some of the other teams we played weren't at the Premier Division standard so um, it was great and um, yeah one of the standout moments was when um, you know they went up against it and Jesse got the yellow card <laughs> like he couldn't have scripted it it was like uh, yeah it was, it was a quality moment definitely yeah I'm sure that one will be remembered in that house anyways but uh, overall women's Premier division wise then obviously the new season starting in March a lot of investment and a lot of movement in various degrees what do you expect from the season and who do you think's completed the best business so far yeah, I think um, a lot of we've seen a lot of re-signings anyway. Um, so far, I think Rovers are probably the ones that have, have announced the most um, mm. committing their future. I think is the word they're using these days, even though it seems to be only one year, one um, year contracts um, majority are anyway. But I think they've only lost Jess Gargan as far as I know at the moment anyway. So um, I think they'll really try to be pushing on. I think last year they won't have been happy to not have won anything, you know. Um, but uh, I think I suppose it just proves that you know it does take a while for a team to gel, even if you do have a lot of quality players um, so I think they'll really come good this year I, I, I kind of um, I think they're definitely ones to watch but you know you can't write off the likes of Shells and obviously P-Mount um, who had such a successful campaign last year when no one expected them to do it I think it was probably the most I think I think it was nearly the, the kind of the best almost um, title like of all of the most, most well deserved I suppose title um, in all of the, the years of the league because they put so much effort in and um, yeah like I said they they didn't um, kind of not many people would have given them a chance at the start of the season and they definitely kind of had that driving them on I think throughout the season And what about your own Galway will they how do you think they'll fare because obviously the All-Ireland Cup last year they had success so it'll be interesting to see how they fare this time Yeah I think it'd be great to see them kind of push up right up the table you know and really try to challenge you know it is it's tough um, to kind of do it consistently over a league um, and, and to end up at the top you know you can kind of they had a really good start I think and then they kind of dipped a little bit um, in the middle of the season which is always is going to happen I suppose but um, it'd be nice to see them really really up the top end and um, um, obviously the All Ireland Cup is back again this year so you know they'll be trying to retain that and then it'd be really great to see them um, push on in the FAI Cup as well I, I think they, they're kind of unfortunate to lose out early enough last season so it'd be really good but I suppose every team in the league who, who maybe mightn't be challenging for the title is always trying to get to the, the Cup final so um, only two teams can get there so you know it'll be, be great to see Galway up there next year the All Island Cup is a funny one because it's probably one from the women's game that the men's side would love to see implemented that kind of way. But on the rest of the, you were mentioning there about the WFAI Cup, at Lone Town winning that must give hope to a lot of teams around the league that this can be done. For sure and especially when Athlone didn't have you know maybe the, the best of, of seasons in the league you know you can really then um, if you put the focus into the cup and uh, they, they did come out good the good side of penalties as well which is great uh, but it was it was nice to see I think it's always good to see kind of a bit of a outsider win the cup as well because um, the other the top teams have so much success and they're used to it um, that it was nice to see, to see Athlone come away with that and they obviously had won the, the President's Cup as well at the start of the season so they kind of had I suppose the a little bit of taste of silverware and they, they obviously then drove on and that kind of gave them the hunger for the cup as well. 
that was on penalties as well. I'll never <laughs> forget it. I was at it. Where, did you see it? No, I can't. I, I was at it and I remember the penalties were going on and there was a load of young boys down oh, one I end do, yeah, I waiting for the penalty yeah, shootout. Yeah. And then next thing it was down the other end. So you just see all the boys legging it down <laughs> the other side. But that shows you just how yeah, much Yeah, they had a really big, I think, um, uh, attendance that day as yeah. well. So yeah, it was great to see the interest grow. It does. And hopefully that um, goes league wide because with so much hype around the women's national team, you'll hope now that it extends to the women's premier division as well that's the thing it's kind of how do we sort of harness that interest now back into the league and I think um, TG Carroll will be showing a, another um, kind of uh, I suppose a high number of games as well this year even more than last year I think so um, that should really you know it's an outlet there for people to watch it and um, then you know like I said the young girls then coming through as well like once they can see it um, and see it on the TV as well is, is really important that then they can kind of um, there's just more interest in it and they'll hopefully then that'll kind of increase um, attendance and just overall kind of push on the league to, to higher standards. Great stuff. I'm hoping so too. We'll keep the fingers crossed. But my thanks to Maeve de Berke for calling into studio this afternoon.